My name is Abby Furnish. I'm one of the coordinators of this uh, seminar series we put on with the library on stock assessment science. And today we're really happy to welcome Dr. Jim Thorson. Dr. Thorson joins us from the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where he leads the Habitat and Ecological Processes Research Program. There he works to develop and integrate stock, ecosystem, climate vulnerability, and habitat assessments. So lots of stuff as well as a good focus on spatial processes, life history, and ecosystem science. Today, he's going to be speaking to us about ecosystem data assimilation and approaching scales with uh, numerical ocean models. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. These um, NOAA Library seminars are such a joy to have seen come together and grow an audience, and thanks for the work on that. Um, the title, as slightly revised, is Data Assimilation for Fisheries, Climate Impacts on Ecosystem and Animal Ecosystems and Animal Movement. Um, I'll be noting co-authors as I go. Uh, some of it's drawn on a textbook that I'm writing with Casper Christensen, and I'm happy to um, follow up by email if there are any detailed questions. Um, and hopefully that textbook will be out and ready next year for a, for a class that I hope to teach at University of Washington. And again, I'm happy to follow up. So um, my feeling is that anybody working with NOAA at some point is sort of obligated to refer to these sort of um, forecast uh, zones for hurricanes. And it's sort of this canonical example of um, an amazing way to communicate with the public um, with sort of, you know, the general public who, you know, homeowners who might have to leave, um, you know, specialized public, like people making sort of specific technical guidance, you know, politicians, and then also sort of the legislature, you know, where shrinking that sort of predictive zone is sort of a claim for additional funding for hurricane forecasting. Um, you know, broadly speaking, this is a form of data assimilation where there's sort of known physical properties about the atmosphere and the oceans that we that we can build a model with. But there's also these sort of observations, um, you know, like flying planes through a hurricane that that provide additional information at a finer scale. And so, you know, as I understand it, a lot of these models try to assimilate the data, the observational data on top of this structure provided by a forward projected numerical model. And that's what I'm gonna call data assimilation. And the goal, you know, that I think at NOAA we should have is to extend data assimilation to biological variables. So not just ocean physics or lower trophic level, but you know, fish, juvenile fishes, adult fishes, protected species, and humans. And this is of course hard because you know, animals and people were smart animals that are adapted to our environment, were you know, economically or fitness optimizing, culturally optimizing. Our behavior is heterogeneous among individuals, and there's no simple um, you know, set of expressions to solve the movement of animals. So for instance, in this case, this is, you know, from track turtles, it's a map of different release and then current location of satellite tagged turtles, as I understand it. And, you know, some of them are moving, you know, tagged in the Southeast and moving along the Eastern seaboard. And then they're, they're moving, ending up in different places. There's this sort of vector field of wind currents um, in the background, which is, you know, presumably purported to help drive their infection. And our goal is to come up with a way of, you know, understanding movement. I think this movement piece is the real key. It's the hardest part of data simulation for ecological systems. And so that's what I'll focus on. And um, if we could forecast movement, we've done a bunch of, you know, previous studies with high resolution growth rates and, um, you know, size at age, densities, and movement's sort of the piece that's been hard, the hardest nut to crack. Um, if we could forecast movement in this sort of data simulation way, we could apply it to a wide range of things like, you know, North Atlantic right whales, you know, shifting distributions for fishes under climate change, you know, individual fishing trips or illegal fishing. Um, and so there's a, a ton of things that we need to be forecasting. And um, my goal is to really embed this discussion of movement in sort of the classic physics of, of um, partial differential equations. So um, in this case, there's this partial differential equation for a density field across space and time. 
and that's changing under three sort of concepts diffusion or the kind of random or un, unmodeled variation and location by individual uh, passive drift like a vector field like those wind um, that wind vector field and then taxis which is this sort of tendency for animals to move towards their preferred habitat and so I'm not you know I doubt anybody is super interested in the, the PDE listed, but there's these sort of three concepts of diffusion, drift, and taxis that we want to model in continuous space and continuous time, and we'll discretize space and time and solve that uh, in a variety of ways. So the, um, the examples I'll use to kind of build this, one of them is a whole of ecosystem synthesis. One of them is individual tracks using archival tags, and one of them is synthesizing data to estimate movement. Um, one and three are published, two is a, a chapter in the textbook. Um, and I'll say that I'm happy to take questions, uh, like maybe one question per section, um, if people have kind of a pressing short-term clarification they want. So the first one is this whole of ecosystem synthesis, this sort of effort to um, bring together all of the biological and physical measurements from the, from an ecosystem and use that for short-term forecasting. It was published in Ecography, um, I guess, two years ago with a long list of co-authors and thanks to them. And, um, you know, we, we kind of scratched our heads and put together this list of different system variables in the Eastern Bering Sea. So we have um, bottom temperature measurements in the spring and fall or uh, summer and winter. Um, we have our regional ocean modeling system, hindcast and forecast of those same variables. We've got small and large um, chlorophyll in the spring and the fall from field sampling. We have um, copepods, they're kind of larger stages uh, in the spring and the fall. We've got a surface trawl of age zero pollock. Pollock's an important species in the region, both economically and ecologically. Um, we've got exploitable biomass, like large adult biomass from a bottom trawl of five species. We've got seabirds opportunistically, and then we've got a spring and some, uh, a spring and fall um, fishery um, called the A season and B season. So this is sort of, I think, a slice across the whole ecosystem, um, sort of focused on pollock and some of its uh, related uh, ecosystem variables. Um, in terms of data availability, we've got, you know, varying coverage across um, time and between seasons with a big block of data for adult fishes in the summer. That's our kind of stock assessment bottom trawl survey. But we've also got a lot of different data, you know, increasingly with seabirds and, and so on. So um, you, you, we've got least coverage in the winter and spring, um, but we are trying to track sort of seasonal, interannual, and spatial dynamics. And you can also think of these different measurements as occupying different parts of the vertical distribution. So, um, you know, there's a bottom trawl, there's sort of these um, vertically integrated measurements of lower trophic uh, processes like copepods and chlorophyll. And then there's these kind of surface measurements, you know, surface um, characteristics like, you know, the, the fishery. And um, the simplest way to do this, I mean, the, the way, you know, we wanna model this um, using something that allows us to have what's called a representation theorem. So the idea is that if we have a, a kind of asymptotically increasing data that we can, um, you know, characterize all the processes that are happening. And um, balancing that with some structural specification, we end up with this, um, what's essentially like an empirical orthogonal function uh, analysis, which is, which is widely used in oceanography. Um, and that ends up with this linear predictor that has a, Parameters representing temporal variation, spatial variation, spatial temporal, habitat covariates, and catchability covariates. Um, it's in a generalized linear model. And we basically are projecting a small set of maps. This epsilon term is being projected by these variables L across years, which is the EOF, the kind of thing that's shared with empirical orthogonal functions and it's projected across categories of the ecosystem. And so we'll, we'll see some of the output and it hopefully will make sense as we go. Um, I'll note that we're also doing something called delta, the um, delta correction, like a spatial um, delta correction to intercalibrate our measurements of winter and summer temperatures with our ROMS model 
hindcast and forecast of those same variables. And that's easy to do in this um, in this this factor model framework. So we're estimating a spatial map for each of those where that difference is the um, difference in mean at a given location between the modeled and the observed value of temperature, for instance. But then they share this epsilon, so they're sharing sort of the forecasted um, component um, or the interannual component uh, 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 is shared. Um, so, you know, in more details can be found in the paper, but um, each of these variables has a, a characteristic spatial map. So bottom temperature is lowest in this kind of purple color in the middle domain and lowest in the north. Sea surface temperature is kind of our lowest in the north and highest in the south in kind of yellow. Um, pulling a few of these out, I don't know if my mouse actually works. I should have asked about this, but. Um, it does. Okay, great, great. So in the spring, there's this Zemchug Canyon um, that chlorophyll has highest densities off Zemchug Canyon in the spring, whether small or large. By the fall, chlorophyll has hot spots that are driven by, you know, um, mi vertical mixing due to storms, so there's less of a spatial pattern. Um, Calanus and this, you know, this copepods in the spring and the fall. Um, Pollock and uh, these five fishes, these five demersal fish and invertebrates have kind of distribution maps that a specialist would recognize. Um, and then the capture processor, the fishery fleet is further south in the spring and further north in the fall. And these fulmars and shearwater, these seabirds, again, have distributions that we'd expect. So you can get this sort of distribution for each um, system component. Um, and then it has these sort of time, this time index that it's freely estimating. It has two of them, technically. And the first of them is highly correlated with the cold pool extent, even though cold pool extent is not specifically in the model. So there's this 0.89 correlation between cold pool extent and sort of the mode of the dominant mode of variability in the Bering Sea, um, and because we've got forecasts of of the from the ROMS model, we can also um, kind of take do this sort of very simple-minded sort of forecast, um, assuming the ROMS model is exactly correct. I mean, nobody thinks that the ROMS model is in phase when it's forecasting the future, but it gives generally a sense that those um, warm conditions that have held in the recent past are expected to continue into the future. Um, and then we can look at these maps of the spatial response for each system component. So what I wanna pull out is that this, um, this factor is positive when the cold pool is small. And so um, when the cold pool is small, we have a shift of Pollock to the north, higher densities in the north of Pollock. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's I went backwards again. We have higher densities of Pollock in the north and Pacific Cod in the north when the cold pool is small. And we have higher densities of Arrowtooth, which is a major competitor and even predator on juvenile Pollock. Um, and again, when it's, when it's warm, um, let's see, bottom temperatures are higher kind of in this middle domain, which is, which makes sense. So, um, and when it's, when it's warm, the fall capture processor and the spring fleet are kind of to the north or into Bristol Bay relative to an average year. And so we can get these sort of um, descriptions of how the ecosystem is, is changing over time the kind of typical response of each, each ecosystem variable to that mode of variability. We can forecast each system variable into the future. So if we do these sort of um, kind of simple-minded forecasts, we expect future, you know, continued warming through the 20, 2030s based on this ROMS model output, a continued decline of fall calanus, fall copepods, which is thought to be important to overwinter survival of Pollock. We might expect to have higher densities of A0 Pollock, even if they have trouble surviving that first winter. We, we'd expect a continuing northward shift of, of Pollock and Arrowtooth flounder, and sort of a continued northward shift of, of the Kekcher processor fleet in the fall to track them. Um, we can kind of put numbers on that by computing an overlap metric. So these are the Schoner's D spatial overlap between different system components associated with age, age zero, or associated with Pollock. 
so there's um when it's warm in the recent years or this earlier stands on the early 2000s we had lower overlap of Aegisir pollock with its important prey of fall calanus. Um, when it's warm, we have higher overlap between adults and Aegisir pollock, which might lead to higher cannibalism. We have higher overlap when it's warm between arrowtooth and adult pollock, their competitor. And we have um, decreased overlap between the bee season fishing effort and pollock. And so basically all of these different sort of spatial overlap connections indicate that um, you know, things get somewhat worse for Pollock um, when it's warming. And we can actually combine that with a separate spatial stomach content analysis to kind of flesh out this conceptual model of the Bering Sea for Pollock, where a positive, an increase in cold pool extent, um, like a cold year, let's see, let, let's say a negative, a warm year has a low cold pool extent that causes increase of air tooth in the northern middle domain and an increase in Aegisir pollock in the northern domain, that leads in turn to increased predator-prey overlap. And we've seen otherwise that when there's a low cold pool, when it's a warm year, there's more Aegisir pollock in arrowtooth stomachs. Um, so this sort of story is sort of corroborated by stomach content data that in years with a small cold pool caused by low ice production the preceding winter, um, Pollock and its major predators and competitors are pushed into this arena in the north of the Eastern Bering Sea that results in greater consumption of juvenile pollock. So um, if there's any short question, I'd be happy to take it now or I could move on to the next section. So far, no questions, Jim. Okay, so um, the next piece is work, ongoing work in collaboration with Julie Nielsen, um, you know, based on an ongoing tagging design that Suzanne McDermott has led. And, um, you know, it's work that we have been including in a chapter of, uh, of, of this textbook that we're writing, uh, Casper and I are writing. And that the point is to um, show, rel you know, that last chapter was, you know, that last section was essentially a whole of eco ecosystem description of dynamics. Here we want to become more mechanistic and think about specifically how we can model the mechanisms of movement that underlie what the patterns we saw. So um, again, here's this um, partial differential equation. Um, I'm circling this, this term H, which is this habitat preference function. And um, the gradient applied to that, this sort of um, nabla term, defines a vector field where fish tend to want to move in the direction of increasing preference. So um, we can estimate this preference function as a, a linear combination of covariates. And then we, inf you know, we presume that fish will move from a given location in the direction of their increasing preference. Um, and that defines a vector field in this um, partial differential equation. Um, importantly, we can do this in a way that's efficient enough that we can estimate parameters in this term alpha given data and we'll get to that in the in the in these next sections so um before we try to fit to data you know we can estimate movement based on um like individual or lagrangian movement um from an initial point so if you imagine you've got a central place forager that starts out at x and y of zero at the center of this top left panel. The vector field is pointing away from that point of origin at an initial time. And so you can simulate sort of a track from that partial differential equation where they tend to move away for 50 time intervals and then they move back to the point of origin for another 500 time intervals. I think I said 50, I meant 500. And so you can simulate, um, different tracks foraging trips of a central place forager and that's what's shown in the bottom right here um you know it's efficient to do this in that case we're not estimating parameters so it's very very quick we can also use that same model um and fit it using well fit it to data so in this case this is um, a tagged northern fur seal tagged by the um, alaska center polar ecosystem program at st paul in 2016 
Um, and, you know, for every time interval, I've got this sort of blue circle that represents the um, confidence interval for its predicted state at a given time. Um, and I've thinned it just to, um, I think in this case, 25, maybe 20 locations that I've given the model. And so it's predicting um, the location between those observations as a state space model where the variance is small when you have an observation, it kind of balloons out and then compresses back down when you get to the next observation. And the green line is, you know, is the sort of um, reconstructed direction of a track where it starts and ends at approximately the same location being a, a central place forager. Um, so in that latter case, we're estimating parameters, and again, we can do that quickly as a state space model. Um, we can also, alternatively, we can we can discretize space and do this as this like density model or Eulerian model. And um, I, I stress the Lagrangian and Eulerian terminology because this is a big part of numerical ocean modeling as sort of the um, domain that's defined and, and, and how these are done. You know, there's different... Um, you know, like I think the MOMS uh, modular Earth model, that ocean model that's being discussed, um, has components that are Eulerian and Lagrangian, and, and some of the Eulerian bins vary by depth and so forth. And we can do a lot of that same thinking um, in this movement modeling framework. So anyway, that's a tangent. But um, if we discretize space in a one-dimensional domain and a 25 bins, um, hypothetically, in, in panel A, we might have depth that's increasing as we go from west to east. We might have bottom temperature that's high on the boundaries. And we can define a preference function based on those two covariates that's shown in black on that panel A. Um, if we, we can use that to specify what's called a diffusion matrix and a taxis matrix, and then we integrate that instantaneous movement rate to different time intervals. Um, and and we can explore what would happen hypothetically to an individual released at different locations after a different set of time. So um, in panel D, there's this simulation about what happens if you release an animal released at the gray bar um, after one time step or three or 10, or if you give it infinite time, what's the kind of stationary distribution? And you know, regardless of where you release it, that black line, the stationary distribution is the same. That's because this um, matrix connecting different locations is ergodic. It's sort of um, fully connected. Uh, you know, but the but the intermediate behavior as animals tend towards that stationary distribution is different depending on their release date. You know, release location. Um, and so this, this provides this habitat preference function and diffusion, which I'm calling a taxis diffusion model. It provides a way of solving for what's the expected distribution at any time in the future, given that you saw an animal at a given location in time. So, um, you know, doing this at a very high resolution, we can do this, and this is again taken from the textbook. Um, we spent some time thinking through kind of scale invariant parameters. So like if you change the discretization, um, how does that, you know, propagate through the process so that you could have the same parameters resulting in the same dynamics, but at higher, lower resolution. So here's um, two different simulations at different resolution of a hypothetical release in time one of some invading individuals released on the east coast of Madagascar that hypothetically prefer lowland habitats. Um, their stationary distribution, you know, if you if you let them go forever, would end up at this log stationary high resolution or the low resolution looks a bit like it if you squint. Um, and, you know, again, doing that at um, higher, low, you know, vastly different scales ends up after nine time intervals at sort of approximately the same habitat utilization. So. Um, you know, hoping to convince people that we can solve for um, predicted distribution regardless of scale over a different set of times um, in this sort of uh, diff diffusion taxis uh, model. Uh, we can also fit that to individual archival tags. So this is um, a single archival tag example um, showing bathymetry, um, you know, shallow to deep purple to yellow, 
um, the estimated preference given a predicted response to bathymetry um, on the left and showing confidence intervals on that. And then also mapping, taking the dominant eigenvector of that movement process and taking that as the stationary distribution. Again, this is at very high resolution. There's you know, over 10,000 grid cells. Um, I think it's at three kilometer by three kilometer resolution. So it's the resolution of the um, current ROMS model used for the Bering Sea. Um, and it's inferring this bathymetric uh, response function, preference function, <laughs> that um, preference to bathymetry function um, based on a single tag that was uh, at large for 90 days. Um, we can also use this to do what's called a, a, a filter and smoother. This is implemented as a hidden Markov model. So um, at the initial date of release, which I guess was February 21st of 2019, it starts out here. Um, and then based on attributes of the tag, we can do this filter and smoother to estimate um, at, you know, a, a predicted probability in different times until it was eventually the tag popped off and communicated by GPS um, May 23rd of that year. So um, we can infer move, you know, unknown diffusion and preference function parameters, and we can also use the model to um, sort of predict uh, the location of this animal over time. Um, yeah, okay, well, I've started summarizing already. So we can, we can discretize a, um, a partial differential equation that includes diffusion, taxis, and drift. We can discretize that in space and fit it to animal tags. Um, we can use that same process, regardless of discretization, to recover the same parameters. We can infer habitat preference from individual movement. Um, you know, so inferring habitat preferences allows us to go make inference from a single tagged individual to population scale process. Um, that's what I mean by part bullet three there. Um, well, I guess that also says that, you know, once we estimate um, habitat preferences, we can extrapolate what would be the long-term habitat utilization. And that's sort of what we often want to manage from for things like essential fish habitat. Um, and then we can also use that same model and apply it either to a single individual or to a vector of densities. Um, and so we can use it to fit to tags and then simultaneously apply the same thing to, um, you know, a, a density vector at a different resolution. So you've got this world where we could have um, a stock assessment with high resolution data from an archival tag as one component of a joint likelihood. And then using that same process at a different resolution, the, you know, the resolution of the assessment model itself. Um, I'll pause there. That's the the end of that second unit. Um, we, we, we do actually have a question, Jim, um, that came in just now. Uh, the question is, and forgive me for botching the pronunciation of things, for the pathometry predictions, why were ROMS models model outputs needed, and what were the other variables? Yeah. So um, if that is, I'm. I'm thinking that question relates to, let's see, I'm just trying to look back here. So this one, um, I think it must relate to this question, the bathymetry and how bathymetry is being used in this um, hidden Markov model. It's applied to um, data from a Pacific, a Pacific cod, a tagged Pacific cod. Um, it's not using any ROMs information at all. It's just using well, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not. This this was a, a, a data layer that Julie Nielsen had used while translating the raw archival tag data into data likelihoods. Um, and I, th I thought it's based on the Zimmerman bathymetry product, um, not on ROMs. Um, I'd love to extend this and use it with other covariates like bottom temperature or um, you know, prey densities, like eufausid density, you know, krill densities. Um, and, you know, the math and code are there. 
it is just requires the kind of workup of those covariates at the scale we want. Um, I'll just give a pause to see if anybody jumps in with a follow-up to that question, but um, okay, so um, the, th the third piece of this is um, summarizing a, a, a paper, shoot, I should have the date here, um, that also came out a couple years ago, um, again by a, a long list of colleagues at the Alaska Center and elsewhere and published in Fish and Fisheries, where we try to demonstrate that we can synthesize different data types using this um, diffusion taxis framework. So it's not just applicable to tags, but you can do data integration with it. And the reason I bring this up is, is this long laundry list of, of kind of conventional and next generation information we have about movement. Um, you know, so we've got, for some species like sablefish, we've got, you know, 30 plus years of high sample sizes of conventional tags. They're hard to analyze because they, you have to condition on recapture or release. Um, we've got kind of our conventional survey data, like our monitoring data used for stock assessment, and that's our totally different data set. You know, it's monitor, point, point count data. It reveals the outcome of movement, um, but doesn't directly measure movement at all. We've got fishery data that occurs in a, a, a broader seasonal range, and so it might reveal, you know, point count, it's point count data um, that might reveal movement in other seasons, but its interpretation depends on assumptions about catchability and um, inclusion probability. Um, but, you know, some of the more fun, I mean, we talked about archival tags already. We've got all these fun new things like movement movement gates, I'll call them, you know, so like weirs in a river are an old technology where people count the number of fish that move over like a little object that forces them to the surface. Um, but we essentially can do the same thing now in the ocean with these upward facing acoustics. We've got these um, these moorings where the MACE program at the Alaska Center has these um, transceivers that project sound up in the water column, they bounce off fish, they come back down. They do it at such high res temporal resolution, they can identify individual fish as they're moving west or east. And so, you know, they can count the total flux of individuals across this single um, acoustic, or you could have a line of them and you count flux, you know, total aggregate movement across a boundary like the US-Russia border. Uh, not border, the um, convention line in the ocean <laughs> separating the U.S. and Russia. Um, we've also got selection experiments like classic um, laboratory experiments, chemical genetic parasite markers, and um, occurrence in predator stomachs, you know, so under this theory that, you know, for some important forage, forage species like krill or, you know, um, schooling pelagics, we, we might have a hard time matching the efficiency of their natural predators in, um, in finding them and sampling them. So um, I'm applying this to a case study involving uh, Bering Sea Pacific cod in the eastern and northern Bering Sea over about 30, 30 about 40 years, um, separated into two seasons. Uh, and in this case, we compiled bathymetry and summer and bottom bottom temperature. We're fitting it to um, the summer bottom trawl survey, um, separate summer and winter longline fishery CPUE, and then conventional tags. As we saw, this Pacific Cod also has archival tags that would be super informative, um, but we're not far enough along. You know, the 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 program that has been releasing those is 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 still analyzing them. Um, and then we've got longline fishery effort um, as an offset for tag recapture probability. So um, in terms of co covariates, we've got this like stars object that compiles a bunch of rasters um, for um, bathymetry, but comp you know, compiled by Mark Zimmerman. And then these climate um, hindcasts and forecasts of summer and winter bottom temperature from the Bering 10K ROMS model integrated over five, bottom five meters. Um, and we can put this into the uh, diffusion taxis model and again, estimate this um, response curve, this habitat preference function 
and how it varies as a function of bottom temperature and bathymetry. And um, I should say up front, you know, this is not in any way intended as sort of the authoritative, you know, picture of um, Eastern Bering Sea Pacific Cod, um, in large part because, you know, we are only using bottom temperature and bathymetry. You know, we know cod have a lot of, um, you know, spawning um, site fidelity, and we have gone on to do some work that's not complete, trying to um, use expert judgment to draw maps of spawning aggregations and use that as a covariate. Um, you know, we also want to eventually compile things like, you know, prey densities like euphausids under the theory that those um, prey densities are, are, are likely a, a big part of what's driving um, seasonal movement. Anyway, um, without those sort of higher quality covariates, we don't end up with super precise predictions of their habitat preference, and we'll see the effect that has on the model. Um, but, you know, what we do have sort of makes sense. You know, there's a decline in habitat preference um, um, for sub-zero temperatures, and the model, for reasons, you know, per perhaps dubious reasons, thinks that they prefer uh, warmer temperatures. And then these um, predictors are sort of confusingly labeled. It's, um, it's actually sort of um, the preceding, let's see, the preceding, um, the movement going up to the summer. So in, during the summer, they move onshore, uh, the model thinks, and so they prefer, um, well, anyway, I, I, f I forget the summer and winter bathymetry story right now. Um, but we can uh, fit the model, we can estimate preference, and then we can do, well, I'll start with this. We can estimate preference and log density in the summer and winter. And here I'm just showing a couple selected years, 2002, 2012, 2017, 2018 on the bottom. Um, in the right panels is the predicted log density in the summer or the winter. And you know where I don't trust the model, for one thing, is that it doesn't predict much southward movement from summer to winter. So it's not capturing what I think everybody agrees is their sort of seasonal um, summer to winter movement. Um, and similarly, that you know, it's not capturing that because it doesn't have much of a decline in preference in the in the in the north during the winter the way that I would have expected. Um, but it does, you know, have um, sort of lower preference for the summer in the um, cold years in the middle domain. So that's sort of a feature of cod is that um, we have every reason to think that they avoid cold waters. Uh, in the summer, and that kind of pr provides this sort of um, barrier of their movement from offshore, inshore, in cold years. So the model captures some of that. Um, you know, with the model, we can do these sort of experiments where we hypothetically release an individual at this red point at the beginning of a cold stanza or a beginning of a warm stanza, and um, we can watch its sort of um, habitat utilization after six months or 12 months or 18 months, 20, 42 or 66 months. And we can compare it between the warm and the cold. During the warm, you know, eventually we think that they will tend to get further north than they would under a similar cold stanza, but there's not as much difference between cold and warm cycles as we, as we think occurs in nature. Uh, we can get these sort of um, statistical residuals and use sort of standard model selection on them. Um, which I won't say too much about. Um, and we can get movement fractions. So we can take this high resolution model and then we can coarsen it to the scale of a research model that um, Grant Thompson used for COD back in, I think, 2017 or 18. Um, and so, you know, in that research model, he tried a two box assessment model that had um, the Eastern Bering Sea, the historical range of the stock, and then this Northern Bering Sea, this new area that's opened up as climate change has uh, caused sea ice to decline in the Bering Sea. And so um, during historical times, the model estimates that any fish in the northern Bering Sea is likely to move back to the eastern Bering Sea, like 0.4 to 0.5 probability, 
And fish in the eastern Bering Sea are relatively unlikely to move to the north. And so it ends up estimating different ways you can get at habitat utilization. You know, all agree that the proportion in the northern Bering Sea is predicted to be like, you know, um, zero to 10 percent of the total Bering Sea stock in the north. Um, the model then predicts that recently the, the fish in the northern Bering Sea are less likely to have moved back. The ones that are in the east are more likely to move to the north. And that, depending on how you calculate it, results in this increase, the decrease in the proportion of the eastern Bering Sea and an increase in the north. And um, we can take these movement fractions and plug them directly into these, this two-box stock assessment model as a covariate. Um, which I'll show in a in a second, but um, we can also do sensitivity analyses to different data sets and see how that affects this estimated proportion. So if we take out the fishery data, it has very little effect on the model. If we take out the survey data, it doesn't really affect the preference function at all, but it affects how much fish the model puts in the north and the east in the first place. And then with no tagging data, the model really can't estimate the rate of diffusion. And so it's kind of low balls how quickly things will adjust in recent years. So we can see that this story that the model is telling is really primarily driven by the survey and the tagging data, um, and that the tagging data is necessary to get at diffusion rates. Anyway, so finally, if we um, plug that covariate in the model, we get a proportion of the Eastern Bering Sea in this research assessment model that's in this gray line. That research assessment model thinks that about 20 to 30 percent was in the north over time and that there's been a spike in the north. Um, by contrast, um, the original, um, no, I'm sorry, I'm telling that exactly backwards. So the original, the original model without this covariate thinks there's a lot in the north throughout the whole time. If you put in this covariate from our analysis, it correctly thinks um, that most of them are in the north, eastern Bering Sea and low in the north, but it really doesn't capture much of a change over time, whereas these dots are the model predicted um, from surveyed years where we have some data. Um, the, the, the model, the survey uh, measurement of how much was in the Eastern Bering Sea. And so neither of these two models in this research model fit the data very well. And so um, the assessment did in fact go back to doing like a one box model for the stock assessment that I won't get into in any detail. So um, I've got about 15 minutes left and, and just a couple slides here, but that, you know, basically my claim is that we've got, um, you know, NOAA as an agency has a lot of it that does um, data simulation to do these sort of forecasting exercises. And it's, I think, really successful. Um, NIMS, by contrast, you know, does a lot of modeling of time series, but it's not spatially downscaled the same way that the rest of NOAA is talking about data simulation. And so um, perhaps for that reason, it seems to me that NIMS um, you know, doesn't talk about data simulation the same way. Um, and so the question is, you know, what what would it take to get us to a place where we can do data simulation in NIMFS at the kind of resolutions that we're doing numerical ocean modeling and climate modeling? And so the technical requirements for this, um, you know, are, are pretty different from what the technical requirements for a numerical ocean model. Um, and that's because we have to be solving for these unknown parameters that vary about individuals, that change over time. There's a bunch of statistical data simulation that we have to do that's not as common within other parts of NOAA, as far as I can tell. So um, for that, you need this automatic differentiation, which is needed to solve for many parameters. We need numerical integration, integration of process errors like Laplace approximation or Hamiltonian MCMC or whatever. And we also need numerical integration of dynamics. Um, so in this case, what I've been showing is hidden Markov solvers or this matrix exponential, um, which I'm using to solve this linear differential equation. Um, you know, so we need numerical integration and we need performant linear algebra support, which makes the whole thing run fast enough that we can do it thousands of times to identify the optimal parameters. And all of that 
those technical requirements are largely done. They, um, you know, there's always improvements that could be made, but we do have the scope to do these types of um, partial differential equation models for animal movement while estimating habitat preferences. I think the, the biggest um, hurdles at this point are these sort of institutional requirements. And, um, you know, so I guess I hazard sort of, um, a, you know, a, a couple claims about how, you know, a, a multi-year effort could work to try to coordinate cross-center development along these lines. So for instance, like, I, th I, I think most science centers have some foot in the game with uh, reconstructing tracks and inferring movement from satellite or archival tags. You know, satellite tags are often attached to animals that stay near the surface or archival tags for things that are underwater where they can't communicate with satellites. And, um, you know, we have the methods and, you know, we have the methods, but we don't really have software for general use of these taxis diffusion drift models. You know, I've talked with Devin Johnson at the Pacific Islands about kind of uses for their purposes. I think the West Coast has like um, various protected species and uses where they, you know, make species distribution models using tags. And Alaska has these sort of um, sh shifting distribution of commercially important species that we're tagging. Um, and that would also be our, you know, a good use. So I, I'm sure we can fill that list out with every science center. Um, there's population dynamics applications. So, you know, either as an operating model for simulation testing and management strategy evaluation, um, you know, or action, an actual estimation model, um, you know, we basically need to, you know, road test and, um, you know, develop a community of practice for how to do these sort of fine scale discretization of a taxis diffusion drift and embed that within an egg structured model for population dynamics. And then there's a bunch of ecosystem applications that I think are, are, are harder to envision because I mean, there's just more variables to track. Um, as I showed in the first unit, you know, we can do these sort of descriptive, like non-mechanistic models for eco, you know, high resolution synthesis of ecosystem data. Um, you know, in that case, that had what I'd call ecological teleconnections. And I think they're kind of smart ways that we can put movement into those um, ecosystem models, but uh, the path forward is, 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 is less clear to me. Um, so with that, you know, I, I'd say that, you know, some of these institutional requirements are to be determined. <laughs> um, you know, so I'll end with a, a big thanks to my co-author, Casper Christensen, um, and then a, a ton of people who've contributed uh, as co-authors or, or discussions or, um, you know, data originators in these various projects. And I'll, I'll leave this slide up while taking questions.